Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Heritage Foundation's Executive Vice President, Kim Holmes. Good morning, everyone. Bright and early at the Heritage Foundation. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation. It's a pleasure to have all of you here in the Allison Auditorium. I'd like to also welcome our online viewers. Uh, my name uh, is Kim Holmes. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Heritage Foundation. We are very excited and we are very proud and honored to be hosting uh, this morning's event. Uh, before we get started, as a courtesy uh, to our speakers, I would like to take a brief moment uh, to remind everyone to do a final check uh, to make sure that your mobile device and, uh, is either silenced or turned off. So welcome to the annual James D. McGinley Lecture featuring our special guest, General David Berger, the Commandant of the Marine Corps. General Berger is a true American patriot and an exemplary Marine. He's making some very exciting changes uh, to the Marine Corps that he is here today uh, to share with all of you. Uh, we are honored to have him here to hear his insights and to see what the future holds for the Marine Corps. Uh, we should like uh, also to thank uh, the sponsor for this event, uh, James McGinley, whose uh, generous support uh, makes this series of lectures possible. The annual Colonel James D. McGinley Lecture always features a distinguished speaker talking about the topic of national security. In the past, we have welcomed Victor Davis Hanson, uh, Senator John Kyle, and General James Mattis. So it's a distinguished list, and we're very happy to have another distinguished speaker here today. The Heritage Foundation also partners with the Marine Corps University Foundation to host this event. My co-host this morning is Lieutenant General Richard Mills, who is the President and CEO of the Marine Corps University Foundation. General Mills enjoyed a distinguished 40-year career in the Marine Corps. He led Marines all around the globe in Bosnia, Somalia, Kosovo, Iraq, and Afghanistan. He was also the first Marine Corps general officer to lead NATO forces in combat. So to get the uh, event started, I would like to ask all of you to please join me in welcoming General Mills to the Heritage Foundation. Well, thank you and good morning. Indeed, I am uh, Lieutenant General Rich Mills. I'm the President and the Chief Executive Officer of the Marine Corps University Foundation. And on behalf of the Foundation, uh, it's my privilege to welcome everyone to uh, this year's McKinley Lecture. Marine Corps University Foundation's motto is educating 21st century leaders and warfighters. Our mission is to enhance and enrich the professional military education and leadership development of active duty Marines, both officers and enlisted, at our university campus on board Quantico and at remote sites throughout the Marine Corps. In addition to uh, lectures such as the McKinley Lecture, we endow 10 uh, chairs at the university. We endow other seminars, other special events, again, to enhance the leadership development of our students, both on campus and off. It's our privilege to be able to uh, partner with the Heritage Foundation for the McKinley Lecture Series. Over the years, as Kim said, it's brought forth numerous distinguished speakers. It's addressed critical current issues of vital concern to our country, and it is always involved in a, a very engaging and very interesting discussion and questions following the speech. I have the unique pleasure today of introducing not only our host for the event, but the individual who is responsible for bringing the lecture series together and for whom this event is named. Colonel James Bullitt McGinley, aviators always have really neat call signs, he has spent his entire life protecting American interests both here, at home, and abroad. He's a 30-year Marine officer who served his country in both war and peace in numerous positions of critical responsibility. I first ran into Colonel McGinley in Iraq in 2008 when he was serving in Baghdad. He was a deputy commander and the chief of staff for the Iraqi assistance group. I was out in El Ambar province with the Marines. We served again later in Central Command where he was the deputy commander for Strike Group 5 in the waters of the Gulf, supporting my unit ashore in Afghanistan. Now that I think about it this morning, every time I've served with Colonel McGinley, someone's been shooting at us. So please be careful as you sit through this, all right? His skill as a Marine aviator, he flies heavy lift helicopters, 
is matched only by his legal skills. During his legal career, he carved out a distinguished record protecting individuals from fraud and bad practice in the medical field, and was featured in the Time Magazine cover story for his accomplishments. However, he's not outdone in his accomplishments by his extraordinarily talented wife, who's also with us this morning. Mary Beth McGinley is a force to be reckoned with in her entertainment world for her artistic talent and her business skills. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce the namesake and sponsor of today's lecture, Colonel James D. McGinley, United States Marine Corps retired. General Mills, thank you very much for that very kind uh, uh, introduction. I appreciate that very much. And mentioning Strike Group 5, I look at my Navy Marine Corps team partner over here, Admiral Sinclair Harris, who was the commander of Strike Group 5, and we're honored to have that part of the Navy Marine Corps team here today. Because this is a big week for Marines, I'd like to take just one fast point of privilege and mention that uh, General Joe Dunford, uh, is concluding 42 years of service, and I would think that our 38th Commandant would agree with me that our 36th Commandant, Joe Dunford, probably one of our foremost Marine General Officers uh, in, in my generation. Uh, and we uh, compliment him on his lifetime of service and what he has done for our country, and I think also uh, distinguishes himself as the first Marine Corps Officer to have served in four different four-star billets. Uh, really an amazing accomplishment and an amazing Marine, an example to us all. Well, with that, uh, we are in for, I think, a really exciting lecture here today. Uh, the Marine Corps uh, is constantly, um, I think, productively self-critical. We look at our mission, we look at how we are constructed, and I think that our new Commandant, General David Berger, uh, who is commanded at every level, uh, will be a key catalyst for change at, a, at the right time as America resets uh, coming off of Iraqi freedom and enduring freedom. Uh, the, uh, just to give you a quick uh, background, I, th I think the part that really jumps out of me uh, with a career of service for a commandant is the fact that he had uh, the regimental combat team out in Fallujah uh, at a very difficult time and did an extraordinary job. Uh, his planning guidance, which he has just recently introduced here over the summer, uh, I think does have a slice which uh, really looks at that critical self-analysis, uh, a real, uh, I think, detailed look at force design. One of the quotes that jumps out at me is, seek the affordable and plentiful at the expense of the exquisite. And if you think about how we might uh, not only do that in the small with the Marine Corps, but what that might mean for the rest of the Department of Defense, I look forward to Marine leadership on that issue and the implications that it might have. Uh, today, I expect that we'll maybe hear a little bit about the Marine Corps' orientation into the Indo-Pacific and also the, um, uh, the real need for a commander's ability to meet rapidly evolving future threats. Uh, I expect that that will be uh, a significant part of the challenges that the, all of the services have to meet as we go forward in a more dynamic world. With that, please join me in welcoming General David Berger. was sitting there uh, next to General Mills thinking, General Mills and I are infantry guys, and, uh, so we're not pilots, but we look at uh, the guy who introduced me and figure, I don't know how down in Pensacola they decide what aircraft they're going to fly, but that guy's not going to fit into a little jet cockpit, so he <laughs> absolutely must fly big helicopters, there's no question. Uh, General Mills is one of my uh, mentors for life, so sort of intimidating to be up here in front of him. Uh, I, if I, if I could fo follow your footsteps and do uh, half as good as you did, I'd be, I'd be really happy, sir. Really g good to be here this morning. Dr. Holmes, thanks so much for allowing me to be here this morning as well. It is a privilege just to be asked. And that kind introduction, thank you for also keeping it short, sir. Uh, bullet. I have to think of how you got that call sign, Bullet, but probably a story behind there. 
Dakota, uh, real quickly, has been uh, more help to me over the years than, than you all will ever understand. But his, he's a lot like me in that he's a critical thinker. That's sort of how I was trained. So every assumption, every direction that you path that you go down, uh, questioning that. And I'm just thanking you for continuing to do that. Please don't let up on it at all. Uh, I thought this morning... Uh, I'd offer sort of uh, two parts to this. First, I'll give you I, some, I think I owe you some perspectives on the planning guidance that uh, we published this summer. And I would just tell you, uh, I had the benefit of several months of knowing where I was going. And when you have several months, you can sit down and think and you can write. You know, I, I contrast that with my, my uh, battle buddy, Admiral Gilday, who had two weeks. That's not much time really to think your way through. So I was hugely uh, beneficial of several months of time to think. The second part though is to listen and to learn. Uh, and I mean that, I say that uh, genuinely. Your thoughts, your questions, your criticisms, uh, your poking at our ideas is, very, is a very healthy thing and I welcome that in advance. So I'm thanking you in advance. I think, uh, let me start off talking about where I think we, where I see us. I think the fact that we're in an era of great power competition, uh, perhaps some might debate that for some period of time. I don't think that's open for discussion any longer. Our national defense strategy, uh, which you all are very familiar with this, uh, acknowledges that and demands, in my terms, demands in no uncertain terms, that the services change to meet the challenges of the new world. The guidance, I believe, very clear. Uh, I can tell you that the Marine Corps fully embraces the components of the national defense strategy. I think they're absolutely, uh, will be germane going forward and valid. Uh, and everything that we do has to be aligned with that. The world obviously is, is changing pretty rapidly. And I'd like to thank those uh, who had a hand over the summer in the spring and summertime shaping the deep thinking that, that's required before you publish the sort of document that we had a chance to do. So it, your, your thoughts, your criticisms improved that. And it, places like this are sort of petri dishes for that thinking. And I think they're very valuable. Uh, and I'm, I'm asking you to keep challenging us. I think the strategic realities uh, will cause us to think differently, and I'm gonna go into that. I believe it, the realities uh, of the world cause us to throw out old assumptions and start fresh. We cannot assume that today's uh, equipment, uh, the way that we're organized, how we train, how we select leaders, all of our war fighting concepts, we cannot assume that they will remain relevant in the future. In fact, my assumption, my premise is they will not. This requires, I believe, unshackling ourselves from previous notions of what war looks like and reimagining how Marines will uh, train, how we will operate, how we will fight. And it requires very honest assessments of our strengths and our weaknesses. Based on uh, my observations and those of other folks that uh, I listen to keenly, including uh, a bunch in the room like Sink and others that I've known for some years, I can tell you that our current force, the, your current Marine Corps, to include a large part of the program near-term Marine Corps, is not optimized for great competition. It is not optimized to support a naval campaign. It is not optimized to support the fleet through missions like sea denial, and it is not optimized to deter a pacing threat. So if uh, that's the diagnosis and I'm asking you uh, to ride along with me, uh, you can have your own opinion, but for the rest of this session, just that's where I am, so we'll go forward from there. For anyone who had a chance to read uh, the planning guidance that I published, we published this summer, you'll know, you will recognize that force design is my top priority. I think that is my principal vehicle for um, redesigning, realigning the Marine Corps as part of a naval expeditionary force 
which is part of a joint force and all the requirements that are laid out in the National Defense Strategy. So, um, over the summer and uh, for the last uh, 30, 45 days, we've been developing a vision for where the Marine Corps will need to go into the future. Now, here's where this is a little bit different uh, than previous uh, attempts, not attempts, but previous efforts to do this. The task for us this summer was truly do force design. Look beyond the five-year defense plan. Look beyond the manpower management cycles deeper 10 years into the future. Imagine what force we will need uh, based on some assumptions about our pacing threat and then map that force backwards to today's force, not forwards. And there's good reasons for doing that. This is, I don't think, groundbreaking necessarily, but it is clearly now threat-based um, force design. To help illustrate the rationale, the logic, my logic behind this, about three or four years ago, while I was in Hawaii, uh, during a congressional uh, visit by some members that were traveling to Asia, I sketched over top of, the, of a map three time frames that I thought were relevant. And I was talking about both posture and the composition of the force. And I said from arguably 50-51 until around 1989-90, we had a very clear picture of who our peer threat was. It was a bipolar world. There was both conventional and strategic deterrence in play. Everybody knew who the opponent was. The, all that changed in, in uh, 1990, and then from 1990 till, I suppose, somewhere 2012 to 2015-16, uh, we shifted deliberately into a capabilities-based mode. We didn't have a peer threat. We had technological advances, and we had the resourcing, so we went after capabilities because we had no peer adversary, no peer threat. Along comes, uh, obviously, peer threats again, and to some in this room, it's not really back to the future, but it is, in a way, uh, an approach that some are familiar with from the 70s and 80s. I think that's where we are right now. We have a peer threat, perhaps two, uh, both conventional deterrence and strategic nuclear deterrence are in play. Both are moving, both are advancing, and in terms of a pacing threat, which is uh, something, if you want to talk about later, uh, I think is a fascinating topic, both are trying to gain an edge uh, over each other, looking for vulnerabilities in the other side, sort of like uh, a slinky. And uh, one aspect of that uh, that I'm wrestling with, um, and if you have thoughts on it, would very much appreciate it, is the sense that if you're setting the pace, whether you're a runner or, or a nation, you are breaking trail, you're working harder, you're spending more money. So your choices are, if, if both are moving and you're in a peer-to-peer -peer sort of scenario, do you want to set the pace? If so, can you afford to do so? Because you're going to break trail, you're going to set the pace the whole time. Uh, if you don't, then you're in a react mode. Someone else is setting the pace. And in my opinion, in the last several years, uh, uh, to some degree, we have let an adversary set that pace. So I think all that requires uh, tough choices. I am absolutely confident we will uh, get to a new design by uh, making large changes, not small ones. Or said another way, I do not believe that the annual pace of just force development, that grind, will not achieve what we have to do. There will be an ever-widening gap if we do so. We have to do force design, and we have to change our posture around the world. In other words, uh, I am not content. We should not be content to merely try to keep up. We should set the pace. There are some things, uh, I think, that we can start introducing today in the near term. Uh, in terms of immediate effects. And there are others that will take uh, some years to make happen. And again, the time horizon that uh, I am choosing is 10 years, 2030. 
And no doubt between now and 2030, we will make in stride adjustments. So it will not be an overnight process. We're uh, trying to visualize the force that we will need in 2030 and plan backwards. We will have to be flexible because the adversary is obviously making decisions and the world changes in those 10 years. So we'll have to adjust along the way. But a threat-based force design allows you to do that. It enables you to do that because they are our adversaries. Our competition is not standing still. I think the next budget request uh, for uh, FY21, which we are in the latter stages of, of finalizing, was submitted uh, to OSD this summer. You'll probably see some changes along the lines of what I'm referring to today. But because of where it was, where we are in the budget cycle, I think it'll be the following year and, and the year after that where you'll see the bulk of them. Today, uh, I know it would be great, uh, I would anticipate it'd be great if I could be very specific in terms of force design. I'd love to take this uh, chance this morning to do that. I cannot. And here's the reason why. We have right now, I think, 80, 85 percent picture of what the Marine Corps will need a decade out. But this last step is so important because now is when we run that, that force against a peer threat 10 years out over and over and over again to develop the analytical base that, that's the foundation, in my opinion, we need to justify that force. So I believe in experimentation. I believe in the analytics as a foundation. So we're at that stage now where we're testing the force that we think we will need. And that'll all conclude in another month or two. So uh, perhaps uh, in the future, if, you're, if, you, if you'd like, I think it would be a, a great discussion to have. But we're in that latter stage right now. Let me just talk about that future force in broader terms then. I think uh, three parts of it are very relevant. First, uh, it is an integrated naval force. To be competitive, I believe in the Indo-Pacific region and in the Mediterranean and elsewhere around the world requires a truly integrated naval force. In other words, this is not a personality-based relationship. I think both the Navy and Marine Corps' requirements in the NDS drive us towards a large overlap in our unique roles and missions. We have not focused on that aspect uh, for 20 years. Uh, we have to get creative, and when I say creative, I mean, what can the Marine Corps do? What can Marines do to help the fleet commander fight his fleet? How does that contribute towards a joint fight? That could mean uh, Marines ashore or afloat uh, with longer range um, anti-ship missiles. It could, as an extension, you could visualize them as an extension of the fleet's magazine, basically. Augmenting, in other words, uh, air and, and ship-based fires. Adding, you want to add options then for the, for the fleet commander to get after the geometry of attack uh, challenges that, that we're going to have. Could also mean uh, strapping weapon systems onto decks of ships. And uh, you, you saw that happen about a month, six weeks ago in the Middle East, passing through a strait where a counter UAS system that we had developed for sure, strapped it on the deck of a ship, very successful. We'll need to do a lot more of that. I think it's entirely possible that you could see Marines in small sites doing rearming, refueling for the joint force, for the naval force. That's uh, certainly not a comprehensive list, but is a set of different roles, different mission sets for the Marine Corps going forward. Second, uh, for me, is the concept of a stand-in force. I think the, no question that the advanced advancements in technology and the resourcing that China has put into their uh, missile systems tells you everywhere that we're going to operate uh, in a contested, in a maritime environment, you should plan on it being contested in all domains. So we're, there's no way, in other words, that we're going to travel around, sail around in, uh, in complete control of all those domains. And, and we need to persist. We need the force to remain inside the, IS, in, inside the surveillance range, inside the weapons range of an adversary. 
in that inside that envelope. And here's why, in my opinion. Being inside, if you're a stand-in force, allows you to maintain awareness, which is absolutely critical for the naval and the joint force. You can, it's very difficult to sense from the outside in. It's much more uh, clear picture if you can sense from the inside. So collection and understanding from the inside is very, very important. You can also, uh, in my opinion and experience, deter much more effectively from the inside than from the outside. Long range deterrence loses its effect. There's a physical, geographical aspect to deterrence. And lastly, I would offer to you in my experience in NATO and in Indo-PACOM, deterring uh, is one half, reassuring your allies and partners being the other half. Being on the inside as a stand-in force does uh, achieve the reassurance to our allies and partners that is so critical. It's a huge advantage that the United States has. The third part, uh, I think we will absolutely have to fight in a distributed manner. And this, I am, I am absolutely embracing distributed maritime operations as a naval concept. We must distribute the force for two reasons. Uh, one is because in a peer-to-peer -peer fight, what you, want, what you do not want to do is drive down into the heart of their collection and weapon systems in a narrow funnel. You want to distribute your force so that you pose an adversary a dilemma from multiple axes in multiple domains. The byproduct of dispersing, of distributing, is you also become more survivable, more difficult to detect. So I think you'll see naval formations much more distributed. Uh, I think that's right down our wheelhouse in the Navy and Marine Corps in terms of empowering subordinate commanders to make decisions on their own. I think it also drives into the heart of expeditionary advanced bases, which uh, we are very good at, uh, but have not done uh, operationally in a while. But those expeditionary advanced bases gives you the agility and the sustainability that we will need. And as quoted uh, earlier, I am absolutely a believer in the plentiful over the exquisite and expensive. We've spent a lot of money on high-end ships and planes and systems for the last 20 years. Uh, now, uh, once again, mass is going to have an, an, a quality all its own. So we have to go after the plentiful. We have to go after families of systems, families of ships. And, and just one caveat to that, when I say that, I mean low cost, not uh, cheap. Okay, We have to have operable systems. We have to have dependable systems. they got to be lethal but they also have to be affordable where we can have them in the numbers we need. Uh, an adjunct to that I would offer to you is my learning over time is we need to drive unmanned systems from the top down. The system is built to resist that. Uh, it's built from a program management perspective to defend manned programs, manned platforms. So I think we have to mandate very aggressive pace in fielding unmanned systems. Altogether, I think that that game plan is all about imposing costs. It, distributing, becoming more lethal, fighting as a, as a naval expeditionary force is all about the ability to impose costs. Basically bringing a peer threat to the point where it's, his decision is not today. That's the game plan. Some of the characteristics. Uh, there are many more, but I think i uh, probably stop there because really the, I, I mentioned to you the most important uh, aspect of this morning for me is listening to your questions and having a dialogue back and forth. So, sir, if I'll, uh, we'll pause there and I think we'll, uh, Mr. Wood, if it's okay with you. I don't think I told the comment on no, it's not okay, but <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, sir. Uh, so what we're going to do is just, uh, I've got kind of four uh, baskets uh, of questions. Um, uh, I'm a fan of the document, so I've, I've underlined and highlighted too many things to go into the details um, in such a short period of time. But I, I, I stepped back and looked at kind of the baskets or the buckets um, that, that uh, I think a lot of the subcomponents are derivative of, right? And so um, truly trying to have a conversation and not some kind of a wooden 
you know, dialogue here or something like that. And, uh, and as the commandant had mentioned, you all came here to participate in some way. So we're going to try to maximize Q&A, so I'm, I'm going to keep this a little brief. But just to kind of um, expand on some of the points you made, yeah. um, skepticism runs rampant in D.C., right? Um, you know, and some of our colleagues here know, that the battlefield does not prize mediocrity or complacency. So there are real-world consequences uh, to kind of taking a half-hearted or half-step approach. And so oftentimes what we've seen is the services make these giant, grandiose plans, promise in the world at nickel prices, we're going to deliver it in 18 months. And it never works. Right? So in your planning guidance, you've made some very bold statements. Uh, Marine Corps has been talking about distributed operations for three decades. I mean, some of the first documents came out in 1992, I think. Uh, so how does, how does this effort um, presumably differ from all the other stuff that we have heard for years and years? Does that make sense? I, mean, I think uh, the way you characterize it, I think, is accurate. Some of those ideas, and you and I know uh, the thinkers in the early 90s, I think they were the right ideas. They were not the wrong ideas. But to take an idea into execution, some things have to fall in place, and they were not in place. Uh, they are, my sense is, they are right now. There was no, in other words, there was no peer, if you want to go that far, existential threat in the, in the 90s time frame. There was no pressing need to change. It was an idea that wasn't driven by anything to get it there. I think the, the second part is the, there was no pacing threat. There was no peer adversary. So we were just developing capabilities. It was an idea time frame. Now, there is clearly a sense of urgency. If we do not make a change right now, then the balance uh, is, is not going to work in our favor. So half steps are, when you have an adversary that's going full steps and you're going half, okay, that's, that's not a, that math is not going to work out in the long run. It does, beg the, it does leave the open-ended question of resourcing, and that I can't answer. I know what would be required to make it happen, uh, and that means we're going to have to kill, divest of some legacy, some systems right now that we're very comfortable with, and go into other things. And, and the big gambit is, will Congress resource us to do that? So that, I mean, that is at the heart of a lot of these rhetoric reality gaps, you know, is what I talk about. So uh, great rhetoric. We say the right things across DOD and the services and all that, but you just don't ever see that manifested in the programs. And in fact, you know, counterparts in the Army uh, went through um, a very detailed process of saying uh, some of the legacy stuff just isn't relevant anymore. We want to cancel that. We want to reprogram funds, uh, try to get the Army going in the direction that it needs to be. And just recently, Congress has come back and said, we weren't consulted. Uh, we're putting a kibosh on all that stuff, these great ideas you had for FY 2020. Um, we need to go back and revisit. So right. you know, the system seems to have these antibodies built into it. And uh, you almost have to be a bulldozer, this relentless kind of thing, to drive that. And uh, clearly that's in the, in the planning guidance, but your sense of receptivity on the Hill and yeah. even within the Marine Corps and the various established communities that have equities. Yeah. Um, I, I would not, I'd say a bulldozer approach will not work. Uh, my experience over the past year is you have, first of all, you have to have the war fighting concepts behind it or else it won't fly. Second uh, part of it, you have to have the analytics to support it. If you're going to sit down with staffers, in other words, and ask them to cancel this but put your money over here, they want to see how that fits into a warfighting construct, even though they're not military. If you can't paint that picture for them clearly, then a bulldozer is not going to help. And even after that, even after walking them through uh, how this is how the naval force will fight, which we've, we've spent a lot of time uh, uh, over the past 12 months doing, after that, you still have to have the analytics to back it up. Or else it's just intuitively, I think this will work. And that, won't, that dog won't hunt either. 
And it has to be conveyed in, in kind of plain speak, right? I mean, this, uh, yes. most of the stuff that comes into DC is incomprehensible. I mean, it's just in a foreign language, uh, you know, moving charts and slides that are right. just kind of a wash and arrows and everything else. So um, I like the plain spokenness, the frankness of this particular document. And I, I presume that like the video that was released yesterday, et cetera, is trying to make this in common language Correct. as part of that advertising. Yeah, because I think the people that you we have to convince in Congress, you, you can't talk over their heads. You have to talk in plain language. No acronyms, no complication, straightforward. The second bucket uh, I, I labeled for myself is uh, dependencies. Mm. So the Marine Corps can have these great ideas about distributed whatever, <clears throat> putting small teams with any ship missiles or something on an atoll. Uh, someplace in the Indo-Pacific, but how you get there, how you sustain that and support that, it is so, the Marine Corps is so critically dependent on the Navy and its programs. And you've got these big bogeys out there with the Columbia class SSBN, the Ford class carrier, I mean, just um, all the agencies in town from CBO and CRS and others have talked about uh, uh, the skeptical view of shipbuilding programs, the ability to make substantive change, uh, ship design connectors, whatever the heck those are. I mean, just all this stuff. So how do you deal with these dependencies where you're not the master of your own future? I think that's exactly the lens that I looked at, looked through for 35 years. How much do we need the Navy and how much do they need us? The difference is uh, now, I think arguably that, uh, turn that around and say we did not actually need each other for the last 20 years. Right. Right. I'm unemotionally, objectively, we didn't actually need each other for the past 20 years. We, we were in the Middle East doing one thing, the Navy was doing another thing, and we didn't need. Now I'm looking at it through a different lens. What does the nation need from its military? What does the joint force need from the naval force? That's where I think there is a convergence of our roles and missions to achieve what we have to do against a peer adversary. So, long way of saying, um, the interdependencies between the Navy and Marine Corps, I'm, I'm not even thinking about anymore. It is what does the joint force need from the naval force, and then how do we produce that? This is not about me and Admiral Gilday. This is about a naval capability. And that, you know, that, that joint imperative, I mean, Goldwater Nichols had lots of great things. It's also been an encumbrance in some ways. And it seems um, like I, I was a huge fan of Air Sea Battle yeah. uh, when it first came out. And then the joint monster grabbed onto it. And it was going to be everything to everyone in every set of circumstance and became so watered down that it's essentially irrelevant, right? I mean, that's my view. Mm. And so, um, we see this shift in Marine Corps thinking from other regions to the Indo-Pacific. Uh, we had this famous uh, Pacific pivot some years ago, <clears throat> uh, but then everybody wants to jump on that train, right? And so all the services have to be relevant. They all have to be equal players. And so this, this imperative, presumably, that, that everything has to be joint and of equal measure, it, to me it just doesn't seem to make sense. I mean, you have a European theater, it's essentially kind of land air, you've got a Indo-Pacific theater, which just based on geography is more air-sea sort of things, and so you do have different weights of the size of the force. I mean, so are you getting good feedback from your fellow service chiefs and um, kind of the, the joint community of this? Yes. I, I think there absolutely was a, not a struggle for, that's probably the wrong way to characterize it, but the, the theme of is what we're doing relevant was absolutely part of the conversation. Because if you're not relevant, then you're not going to get resourced. I mean, that's where it ends up, right? So every year, every exercise, every operation, everybody wants to play to be relevant. Because if you're not relevant, you're not going to get resourced. I think I see much less of that now because, not because uh, everybody has to play equally, but because no service has all the capabilities needed to match up against a, a pure threat. In other words, you need all elements of the joint force, not in equal measure, no. And I, I agree with your, uh, your view, and I, I see it the same. The joint force, as it's applied in the Pacific and the Indo-PACOM area, 
would look very much different than the joint force in another theater. And there's, you know, there's been this change in kind of capacity, right? Yeah. So the force today is two-thirds, sometimes less than what it was at the end of the Cold War. Uh, again, just you know, citing an Army number, I think they had 780,000 soldiers in the active component in 1989. Today, they're 480,000. Um, amphibs went from 66 down to 32, I think is where we're at today. You know, ship count, 550 down to uh, below 300. So um, it seems that there is plenty of work for everyone to do without everyone thinking that they have to be involved in equal measure in every theater. That makes sense, but uh, maybe part of the argument. The, the third bucket uh, was this... Uh, I guess it's winners and losers. I mean, it's a shifting priorities and weighting of efforts, right? So you've clearly articulated we're focusing on the Indo-Pacific. Mm. So if the Marine Corps focus is there, what about Latin America? What about Northern Europe? What about you know other parts of the world, right? Operations in and around Africa, et cetera. Um, looking at the type of equipment, uh, various communities. Uh, you know, when you when you shift a weight then you're putting more emphasis on platforms or dynamics or regions or partners, mm. and that generally has to come from some place. So right. there is kind of a winner-loser sort of dynamic in play here, and I'm, I'm assuming that you and your advisors have taken that into account and understanding some of the frictions that that, that generates. Uh, could you talk about that? For um, perhaps from two um, angles. First is that... Uh, for uh, peer, if you accept that this is great power competition, then the corollary to that is global, not regional. In other words, any um, brewing conflict uh, in one part of the world, all our global powers will have global consequences. So you cannot, uh, in, in any sense, try to isolate geographically a conflict into a very small area and hope that it's just going to stay there. So the approach is now, what's the global consequences? The second part, I would say, is framing the way that you described it, Dakota. The, the discussion that we have is, how do you define that in terms of risk? Risk being where you are not uh, in as big a footprint, platforms that you're not going to invest in, what is that risk? You can't, not, not in terms of quantifying it necessarily, but relative risk, because that's what senior leaders get paid for, right? Understanding strategic risk, placing investments where they think they need to, and, and having it with a clear-eyed understanding, I'm accepting risk over there, and it could change. That, that discussion is happening. Uh, yeah, hopefully it's going to spur some additional questions from the audience. Uh, the last bucket, and then I do want to move to, to the getting uh, all of our attendees involved here, uh, and that has to do with this, uh, I call it shocks to surface culture, you know, change management. Mm. Um, forest design is your priority, <clears throat> but when you look at the document, uh, it does take up a, a significant number of page count if you look at just how much attention you focused on it, but almost twice as many pages or material are spent on, on people-related sorts of things. Yeah. How, we, how we manage the workforce, you know, talent management, how you assess, uh, assess in. Um, you've set up this very kind of uh, progressive approach in dealing with things like uh, you know, paternal and maternal leave and, and uh, uh, why does somebody always have to be in a specific career track for 20 years or interests change, and so does the manpower system need to shift? And yet you also say, um, if you're not competing, you're out of here, right? Um, so uh, yeah, there's a difference between in-house resident schools and not. Uh, school evaluations are actually given weight. Uh, yep. there, there's this intellectual component. Um, uh, the education system. You know, so all the things that you wrote about really have to do with people. Yes. And, and you set up some dynamics in there where there will be those who pr pr progress on and those who are asked to thank you for your service and, and go in other directions. So this, this human element mm -hmm. of dealing with Marines and uh, Marine families and all that, if you could just talk about the, the, the people part of this equation. Um, that weighting, that ratio, intentional, not by accident. Uh, I would not, perhaps unique is the wrong word, but the Marine Corps has never been an equipment-centric force. We are a people-centric force. 
that man that, that buys equipment and provides it to the human being, but we're not buy the equipment and then, then let's worry about the, the person behind it. So that part is not new. But how we train, how we select, how we retain all have to change because we are stuck in an industrial age mode in many ways how we educate and, and in fact how we train right now. So we have to adjust that. The human part, I think, in terms of what we bring into the service, um, how we evaluate, how we assess them also has to change. At the center, in other words, in the end for the Marine Corps, we are, we are a very powered down, decentralized, uh, allow company grade officers and junior staff and CEOs, they're the ones making the decisions. If you're that young a force, then you need to train them to a higher level. Uh, and we right now do not give them the reps that they need to build up that experience and make the right, to, to put them in enough situations where the first one's not the first one. For them. That's, I've heard countless senior leaders uh, talk about mistakes that they made at the junior level. Yeah. And somehow or other the service said, uh, we'll kick you in the pants, dust you off, get back into the fight. And, and they say that today that just doesn't happen. I mean, it's a very... Uh, risk intolerant uh, sort of world. Uh, you get a single black mark in your record and you're done. Um, uh, and what you're talking about is, is kind of this empowering, holding people accountable lower, but not killing them uh, for making understandable mistakes. And I, there is, uh, I'm not naive. There, you, could, you could make an, an argument for a risk adverse sort of element within the military. I, I can't tell you that that does not exist. But I would tell you, my own view is the larger, dri the bigger driver has been the pace at which, we, at, at which we've run the military didn't allow you to do things two, three, four times. In other words, you went on deployment for six months, you were back 10 months, you had no redos. If your night attack, if your evolution didn't go well, there was no time to do it again tomorrow night. So, there is a risk averseness part which we must guard against, but we also have to build time back in between deployments where your battalion has enough time to build cohesion, enough time for your leaders to make mistakes, go back, do it again. Right now we cannot do that. We haven't been able to do that for 15 years. We're, we have run the machine too fast. Overworked and... Not overworked, but it didn't allow you to do it again and again, okay, you know, critique yourself, go back, do it again. There was no time for that. Well, my overwork was more of a capacity issue, right? I mean, if, yeah. if the force is 100% employed 100% of the time, where is their slack? Right. Um, but you indicate you're not intending to grow the force. No. In fact, you might sacrifice. So Correct. if the force is shrinking to provide resources, I was saying shrinking, but you yeah. know what I'm saying, uh, to get resources to use in other areas to make these changes, right. if the workload doesn't change. Workload has to change. So I don't know how you go about doing that. We shift <laughs> from doing theater security cooperation. How many events a year are you doing? To a very, not surgical, but a very targeted, focused approach where we do things has to matter. If it doesn't contribute to the national defense strategy in some way, why are we doing it? Great question. All right. Well, we got uh, a good 30 minutes or so, and uh, I saw a hand shoot up right away. So, uh, and uh, if you would, when you get the microphone, state who you are, if you have an affiliation. And I'm really going to be death on this. Uh, no five minute speeches or a question in seven parts. So, uh, if you've got a quick comment to make, fine. Get to a question because we want to be respectful of everybody else in the room, too. So. Okay. Thank you. Patrick Tucker with Defense One. Uh, a moment ago, you mentioned. Uh, mandate an aggressive pace for the acquisition and development of unmanned systems, and I wonder if you could elaborate specifically on what uh, unmanned and AI uh, systems you want to develop and how those differ from what your predecessor was experimenting with. Thank you. We have uh, some years of unmanned aerial systems. All, all the services have some experience there, so we have a head start there. In terms of uh, unmanned surface vessels and subsurface vessels, the Navy has a few years, more than a few years of experience there. But there wasn't an accelerator, there wasn't a driver. Now there is. The initial driver was don't put a human being in there if we can put a machine in there. In other words, lower the risk to the human. But the, the, 
Now the, the additive part of unmanned is how can you make your, your force look bigger, operate bigger with unmanned and manned teaming? How can my wingman or two of them be unmanned? And what is that, how, how does that enable me to actually accomplish the mission in a better way? So I think initially it was in places like um, explosive ordnance disposal where you could put a robot to dismantle a bomb. Why put a, why put a body there? But now it's more like even offensively, how can I, how can I move from ship to shore uh, in a way that I can look at multiple sites, go deeper, uh, the force have longer endurance with unmanned systems? And I'm being brutally honest, my uh, learning over time is unless you artificially demand a rate of investment, of advancement, it won't happen. It's, it's not that we don't like them, it's just everything is built to manned. And resourcing is built to resource manned, manned platforms. So unless you say, you know, five years from now, 150% of it unmanned, okay, now you're, you're, you're driving it. You may not achieve that, but you need a driver. Overlay artificial intelligence. Uh, I'm, I'm, you, can t you can talk certainly for hours. People can on that. I would just say we view it as a way of getting through multiple options in a very rapid manner, sifting through a enormity of data in your command center in a more rapid fashion, necking it down to the two or three options that make sense. I'm going to try to bounce left and right here. Sir. Dave Cooper, CEO of Anglico Good. Tech. Good to see you again, sir. Good uh, to see you. Just wanted to get a little bit more uh, of your vision on Guam and the, uh, the outlying uh, islands. Uh, the um, agreement, I think, latest was 2012, the latest kind of update to that agreement where Japan and the U.S. would invest in moving or in, in building things on Guam, Antinian, and Pagan as part of a Marion, is that what you're getting at? Yes. Yeah, the whole build out of that joint training area and shifting Marines from now stationed in Japan to Guam. That, that uh, plan is in execution. Um, I don't, have you been to Guam lately? Yeah, you, yeah, a month ago. So you know the status of the hangar that's up, the hangar that's under construction, the buildings that are being done. I think uh, both uh, U.S. and Japan uh, are watching each other's investments and the environmental um, challenges are slowing things down and, co and driving costs up like you're, well, you're very well aware of. But the movement along the program as it's laid out right now is, is, has not slowed down. We have, there's, an, there's an agreement between the two countries uh, to move the forces out of Japan in the first half of the 2020s. Uh, in the back here, this one, right. Hi, uh, Matt Baynard, Defense Daily. Um, General, you mentioned a bit earlier about having to, um, you know, make those choices to divest from legacy systems to kind yeah. of shift over to modernization. Um, you know, the Army has instituted a process with Night Court. Do you see the Marine Corps uh, formalizing a similar sort of process? Thank you. Uh, no. Here's why. I mean, th for different purposes. They were going program by program by program. Uh, our approach was for one year, from last summer until this summer, with the Navy, work hard on a war fighting construct for the future, figure out what that is. We're there now. Uh, and then from that, what, what force do you need to, to execute that? As opposed to every night come in and defend your program. So step one for us is center on the war fighting aspects of it, figure out what resourcing you're going to need to do that and what you're not going to need to do that. In the future, will, you know, will we um, use that methodology to, to scrutinize programs? Probably so, but it's, it's in a different way rather than A to Z. We work from war fighting backwards. Uh, Michael Gordon, Wall Street Journal. Following sure. on your uh, answer there, um, 
You mentioned that you weren't ready at this point to unveil a force design because you're still doing experimentation. Could you explain in a little more detail, please, um, how those experiments yeah. will inform those force design decisions, what those specific decisions are, and how those experiments relate to it? And when might you be prepared, do you think, to have a force design? And then just lastly, um, I think we're entering an era with trillion dollar deficits where it's clear there's not going to be steady real increases in defense spending. It's just an internal reality in the United States. Are you planning, is everything that you're projecting, can it be accomplished with the static defense budget? Well, I'll tackle the last one first, uh, sir, if that's okay. Our assumption, my assumption is flat or declining in, in a nutshell, not rising. If that happens, great, but this is all built on, based on flat or declining TOAs, uh, total obligation authority. In terms of uh, the latter stages of force design, I'll break it up. The way that I view it, sir, is I would carve it into three uh, categories, wargaming, experimentation, and modeling and simulation. Now, in some exercises, there's a combination of the two, but all are in play. For the wargaming part, I would we look to things like the Naval, Navy and Marine Corps' global series of exercises in Newport where you bring real current commanders in to fight a 10-year-out scenario with future programs to see how that would play out. That's one aspect of it. Experimentation is more platform by platform, concept by concept, how will that work, which is, is always ongoing. The last part is really our focus right now. The, the first two are enduring. They will never stop. The last part, though, is once you have a construct, an organizational construct, put it into a computer model, play it against a, uh, what the joint force right now is using in terms of a future scenario, and then change a couple variables and run it over and over and over and over again until you get very confident in the structure that you've got. So all three, for me, are are part of the solution. And you had talked about building a, a war gaming center down in Quantico, to, uh, correct? To support that. And the last part of that, I know we're wanting to move on. Uh, like most of you all are aware, that part of the challenge in in the last couple of few years is that the war games and the modeling and simulation now have to go to a high, much higher classification level, which we weren't. Oh, you know, that wasn't uh, the norm before. Now it's um, more and more the norm. So go here in the center, um, young lady. And then I'll go over this side. Good morning, General. Good Gunnery morning. Sergeant Jesse Jane Duff for United States Marine Corps, retired URA. So we have right now a concern, I'm working with the Center for Security Policy, that uh, the Chinese have now got the opportunity to be in our investment, the TS, uh, our retirement funds, the TSP, which is going into effect on 2020. Essentially, we're going to be funding the rope that will hang us. About 5.7 million military veterans, active duty personnel, government employees do not necessarily realize that many of their funds are going to be with these investment companies from China. So the weapon systems that could kill us, the ships that are being built, the Chinese islands, um, this Communist Party essentially is going to get money off the backs of retirees like myself and active duty personnel that are, personnel that are investing in TSP. It's not getting any coverage by the media. I don't know if, uh, from where you're sitting, if they've even brought it to your attention. Not yet, but uh, thanks for bringing it to my attention. We got it now. Otto. Thanks, Gunny. Down here in the front. General Otto Kreischer with the Copley News Service. And I'm sorry, Sea Power Magazine. Yes, sir. Uh, back in the day. Um, in your guidance, you make an emphasis on shifting from uh, the standard gators to a lot of uh, different ships, including, you know, the E-Class and the um, uh, even you even mentioned Black Bottom, which are, are commercial ships. How are you going to make these commercial ships not built to take uh, combat and are crewed by um, uh, civilian mariners who aren't supposed to go in, into combat and are normally not trained for combat operators? How are you going to make that work? Um, as a family and in depth, 
Uh, I understand the nature of your question. Uh, what I know will not work is uh, a few dozen gray-hulled L-class ships by themselves. They will be targets. We're, we need them, but we need much more than just that. I think we have to be much more creative in how we use, to your example, E-class ships, which for a while, uh, frankly, um, we were standoffish from because we felt perhaps they would threaten the amphibious shipbuilding plan, right? Don't talk about them because then uh, we won't get enough amphib ships. I'm in another place now where we need all of that. And we need to really think creatively about how we embark forces and systems on uh, platforms that are not necessarily an LP uh, D-17 or a Flight 2 or an LHA LHD. They're all, if they're floating, uh, we need to figure out how to use it. I don't, the maritime and uh, civilian maritime, the civilian mariner aspect of it, in, absolutely in play. I don't know whether that will fundamentally change. We should not push it off the table just because it's manned by civilian mariners, though. And you're not suggesting that we do. At, it is a different era. Yes. <clears throat> I know we've got some folks masked by the podium. Yes, ma'am. Hi, sir. Thank you for being here. Mallory Shelbourne with Inside Defense. You talked about the execution of ideas, and you said that you're likely to see the implementation really come in 22 and 23, but you're, we're working backwards from 2030. Can you just talk about what that implementation is going to look like in the near term, specifically in the FIDIP, and, and what we're likely to see coming down the pipe in the next few years? I can't get sideways with my boss uh, in terms of where the budget cycle is, of course, because until you know the rest of the process. I would say a um, couple things. A couple of things we don't need to make changes in the POM what we have the authority to do right now. How we train, uh, how we move resources right now within our authorities, we can do without asking Congress's permission to do so. We have to make those changes, how we evaluate people. Um, even the structure of our headquarters uh, is not a match for the future. We have um, a three-star lieutenant general as the head of our, our manpower. We have a three-star lieutenant general in charge of force development and the equipment that we buy. And we have a two-star general in charge of training. Well, if the service's responsibility is to man, train, and equip, is, is that the right setup? So some things I think we can change, we need to change sooner, not later. The larger divestment of things will take time. Uh, because the, we do not have the luxury, and, and you're not portraying it this way, but the U.S. doesn't have the luxury to pull its team off the playing field, make it into a new team, and then two years later go back out onto the field. So we have to make things, we have to make changes in stride. And in some of the platforms that we're going to need in the next five, six, seven years, they are not ready for production yet. So there has to be a sundown sort of program for one and a buildup of another. But to your point, the buildup of the other may not be a replacement for the one that we're, the program that we're terminating. It may be completely different. And I think it, in, in many cases it will be. Uh, back row. <clears throat> uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, my name is Sang Min from Radio Free Asia. Yes. Uh, I have a question of uh, North Korean threat. It is reported that North Korea successfully launched SLBM. Uh, can you tell me how to assess the capability of North Korean SLBM? And last question is about the uh, USN ROC uh, Marine Exercise. Do you have a schedule to implement US ROC military exercise like a KMAP upcoming fall? Yes. What was the last part just to make sure I got it? The exercise between USN ROC a marine exercise like a K map. Yes. So do you have a schedule to implement the exercise in the fall? Yes, those have continued. The exercises, the series of exercises between the Marines 
largely from Japan, from 3rd Marine Expeditionary Force and the South Korean Marines have continued. They have not, they, they paused for a while about a year ago and then restarted and they have continuous, uh, they have remained continuous uh, exercises since then. Um, and I don't see any slacking off of that at all. It's good for both of our Marine Corps to be training alongside each other. And was there another aspect to your question, the, the earlier aspect? LBM from North Korea. Right. What, what's your question about it? Uh, I think that's a, a fair question, but probably not for me to, to do the assessment of. Yes, ma'am. Morning. Thank you, General. Yes, Chris McNulty from Applied Futures. Um, you spoke about the need to, to, to get ahead of the pace yes. that our adversaries are currently leading. And one of the things there, excuse me, is that um, do we actually know the real rules of engagement that we need to be entertaining in order to do that? I mean, 20 years ago, the guys who wrote uh, Unrestricted Warfare had some really interesting ideas. And the example that this lady gave could be one of them. So uh, I know it's not just the Marine Corps' responsibility, but are there people who are really looking at those kinds of rules of victory, let's call them? Yes, uh, I, but I think you highlight a really relevant topic. We're, our rules of engagement, our standing joint rules of engagement every day, uh, are not built for what some people call gray zone competition, right? They're built for a high-end conflict where it's a binary, black and white, much easier sort of a choice. But the competition, the, uh, w the world we live in right now, every single day in multiple domains, there are standing rules of engagement or a challenge there, as, as you highlight. Yes, we are sorting our way through that. Uh, it's magnified, I would say, also by the fact that uh, the adversary is not a democracy. So their use, uh, their extension uh, beyond not just uh, accepted norms of behavior, but even into um, offensive activities in areas like cyber really press us, really uh, for, uh, they're not constrained in the same ways that we are, I would say. So um, I, I think your, your topic, your, the issue you bring up is spot on. And, and yes, we're, 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 uh, we're discussing it. It needs to be changed. Third row. <clears throat> Morning, General. Thank you. I want to make a suggestion and then ask a question. My suggestion is that at Marine Corps University, there be a Dakota Wood Hall next to Ellis Hall, and I make the comparison advisedly. A um, hundred years ago... I live in Stafford, so I love that. It's great. There you go. Um, my question is about sea control and your relationship with both the Navy generally but also with the, with the CNO. A um, hundred years ago, Earl Ellis was thinking through the Marine Corps contribution and, and pivotal role in sea control. What kind of conversations are you having uh, with the CNO about that in the face of this headline from the Washington Times reporting on the parade, this, from this morning's Washington Times reporting on the Chinese military parade, that China's military display forces the Pentagon to confront the end of American dominance. Uh, the, imp the implication is that sea control is being challenged and may be no longer in our hands. So what is the role of the Marine Corps in rational thinkers accept right now that um, any presumption of, of universal dominance across all sea spaces, subsurface and surface, all the time, 24-7, is not a rational thought right now. It is a competition. So to your point, what's the Marine Corps' role in sea control? How does it become an extension of the fleet? Here I draw on uh, thoughts like Captain Hughes' uh, book on fleet tactics, 
I draw on um, Admiral Richardson's and now Admiral Gilday's uh, belief that they need to elevate the level of war fighting to a fleet level, back to a fleet level. And that means for the Marine formations and, and integration into their composite warfare construct and an understanding of what roles, what functions can Marine elements do to make that naval force more lethal, more powerful. And that drives us down into um, methods like expeditionary advanced bases, small units, distributed mobile that can rearm, refuel, sense forward, kill forward, do all those things, uh, and then move, all with a low signature. I'd like to really amplify the Commandant's point about uh, Captain Wayne Hughes, uh, yeah. U.S. Navy retired out at Naval Postgraduate School. is the third edition, I believe, of Fleet yeah. Tactics. It should be a required reading for anybody interested in naval power. Um, Agree. Front row, just so we don't lose folks behind the podium here. Thank you, General. Thank you for coming here. Thank Sir. you for the opportunity. I met you at the Passage of Command. Fred Griffey. Vietnam 0302. I'm going to ask you, I have a whole host of questions, but I'll have to get some of them probably offline. But uh, as one of the earlier introducers mentioned, Madison and Dunford are now gone, and the Army is in control. How do you figure uh, you're going to uh, coexist in the tank when the Army, uh, as exemplified by, by General Milley, uh, how are you going to be able to get the Marine Corps to survive? Because when Madison and Dunford were there, we controlled the, ro the world. Now, it's just you and Frank McKenzie. And I'll bet that Millie will do everything he can to figure out some way to replace Frank uh, because he wants that job. And secondly, uh, would you support changing the name from the Department of the Navy to the Department of the Navy and the Marine Corps? And, and finally, on behalf of your Senate liaison <laughs> office, they're absent. They don't have any swag in the Senate liaison office. <laughs> <laughs> this is this, this, this is a frank discussion. I'm this is a frank discussion. The uh, Department of the let me the middle one, sir. First, Department of the Navy and Marine Corps. Uh, that's got to be up there with like. Are you going to change the tattoo policy? I mean, it's way up there, sir. Uh, that's a political decision. I, my personal opinion really doesn't matter. It, I, I understand uh, all the rationale behind it. Uh, I, I don't have a view. I, it's only a personal view, and it, it's really not relevant. As far as the first part, on Monday, I think uh, today's Thursday, on Monday uh, evening, uh, the Joint Chiefs met, uh, General Milley and the Joint Chiefs met uh, because he had taken over that morning. Good discussion, good frank discussion. And uh, I think there are more than a handful of leaders who are in the same way, uh, worried about the big green machine coming in and steamrolling over everything else. I am not one of them. Here's why. Uh, a, I know Mark Milley have worked as his counterpart when I was in the G3 of the Marine Corps a shop uh, working for General Dunford. General Milley was in the Joint Staff J3. He was my counterpart every day for two years. I know him very well. Uh, he has the um, intellectual capacity uh, to do the job. He also um, understands that this is not a sir. His job as chairman is not a parochial service role. I think there will still be um, some angst about that. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not worried about it at all. There, there are enough checks and balances in our system where even the chairman, were he to be very service-centric, wouldn't go very far. Uh, I don't know the Secretary of Defense all that well, except just for the last three or four months. He seems to be very much focused on strategic issues, not Army issues. I'm not naive, I'm just telling you, based on my personal experience of knowing and operating alongside Mark uh, Milley, uh, I am not concerned that it's going to become an Army-centric joint force. 
If there is evidence to that, I am confident there are enough checks and balances in the system. But I don't, I'm not spending a minute thinking about it. He was told he had to move out of the Army Chief's staff house in the 40s. He does. He's moving. <laughs> I like to shift it on to the ambassador. Thank you, General, for a very interesting conversation. Uh, Jacques Pitlou, I'm the Swiss ambassador. You have emphasized repeatedly that you would like to change the way you recruit, train, select the people. Could you elaborate a little bit? What kind of new people are you looking for? First of all, I think uh, the way that we recruit right now is very successful, very good. We don't need to fundamentally change that. And, and the symbol, the, the, the best I can do, sir, to describe that for you is if, there were, if this room were all 80, all 80 of us Marine generals, there's about 80, and you ask, if I ask, how many of you all been on recruiting duty? A third of them would stand up. A third. Me included. If you want quality and you, and you really care about recruiting, you put your best talent out there, and we do. That said, though, I think there are tools that we didn't have 10 years ago to better screen, to better understand an applicant in high school than just taking a written ASVAB test and a physical test. We have more ways to now to understand uh, what's up here and what's their potential to actually make it through recruit training and on through their whole first enlistment. We didn't have those tools some years ago. Now we do. And we need to learn how to use them, not as a screening tool, but as a way to better understand the population that we're bringing in. Retention. The, the gunnery sergeant seated behind you, right? Retired. Every four years, uh, in her fourth year, um, she would apply to re-enlist, right? And that application would go all the way to the headquarters Marine Corps, who would ultimately decide yes or no. And they, they did, multiple times, right? What my, uh, our approach now is why, why are we still doing it that way? What if in her third year, her second year, we determine she's what we need, she wants to stay, why can't we re-enlist her early? Why can't her commander re-enlist her? Why does it have to go all the way to the headquarters to do that? So in, some, in retention, we have to be more agile. We don't have to wait till her last year, last six months. And, and it doesn't have to go all the way to Washington, D.C. No. If she's got the qualities that we need, she wants to stay, why can't her commander re-enlist her? Then. Uh, so we have to, I think we have to become more agile in how we retain. Well, the, there was a third part, though. Yeah. Actually, not very much. That part does not change. I think the level of, we're looking for a, a, a person coming out of high school or college that wants a challenge, physically, mentally, in all aspects, a challenge, wants to be part of a bigger team. In other words, can, in, can put something above themselves. Uh, they want to make a difference. They want to see the world. Uh, they want to see how hard they can push themselves. And lastly, I would just say they want to be part of something special, something elite. An elite in a positive sense, not in an elitist sense, but in, in terms of a very small, very competitive, they want to be part of that team. That has not changed. Not since she came in, not since I came in. That's the person we're looking for. So my body geometry is oriented this way, and I'm, I'm, I've been ignoring this part of the room. So in the back, the two gentlemen. Good morning, General. Captain Richards, currently a student at EWS, Marine Corps University. Uh, for a research paper that I'm writing uh, focused on your guidance, uh, looking for the, the need for the Corps to change the way it trains, retains yeah. and promotes its greatest resource, its people, as you said. What are your thoughts about moving away from an up or out promotion system uh, towards a system that's more uh, focused on mature, well-trained, technically capable force that can pretend, perhaps uh, specialize at a particular rank or grade uh, to produce a more lethality 
with complex capabilities? I think we, uh, as I wrote, we have to look into that. I don't know where that takes us. And part of the value in writing planning guidance is it's planning guidance. It's not, here's all the answers. It's these things we have to figure out. The upper route system that we have right now, I, we, it's intentionally put in there uh, in the planning guidance as a topic we have to revisit because we are pushing some talent out that perhaps we ought to keep. At the same time, we can't stagnate where um, there's not a constant infusion of people coming into the service and someone can stay here for 20 years and clog the pipes, right? There has to be a way for you to become a major. And if all majors stayed at the same spot and parked there forever, there's nowhere for you to go. But I think we are losing talent right now in the in, in literal upper out sense that we have to open our aperture and find um, room to try to keep uh, more, than we're, more than we're keeping right now. But we can't do it in a way that constipates the whole, the whole system or else you'll be a captain for as long as, how long were you a captain for? Too long. Nine? <laughs> Actually, it was about uh, five, years? five, six years. Okay. Yeah, long time. How long do you think you're going to be a captain? Yeah, could be five, six, seven, right? Uh, Send me your paper once you're done writing it. Morning, General. Captain McBride. I'm also with uh, Marine Corps University, currently EWS student. Yep. Uh, my question pertains to distributed operations. So in looking at distributed operations, uh, particularly looking at EABO, right. is the Marine Corps looking at additional integrations with the Army or any other joint forces in addition to the Navy? And what is the Marine Corps doing to leverage partner forces uh, as well as allies and regions in, to enable that distributed operations and then enable EABO in the future, sir? Yeah. In terms of the joint force, uh, yes. But not in a, as, as Mr. Wood accurately portrayed, this is not a everybody gets four people on the team approach. That, that, that is not what we're after at all. But in my view, the... An ex if, you're, if you're a captain and you're running an expeditionary advanced base, it can serve multiple functions for anybody, right? You don't care. It's not a service-centric, I'm sorry, we're only, you know, we only refuel Navy here. No. You, if you're in an expeditionary advanced base, you're servicing the joint force. Sensing, shooting, killing, refueling, rearming, whatever your role is. In terms of what's at that site, Ta like, like you were brought up, and same, same as me, task organized, right? If that requires some expertise that we don't have, should there be Army or Air Force or whoever has that expertise? Absolutely, yeah. But you're going to want to keep your expeditionary advance base somewhat small because you've got to pick up and move it every 48 hours, right? It, this is not everybody gets 25% on the team. You have to... Sort of the same way, if you're, you know, if you're planning an a, uh, air assault mission, every butt has to earn its seat, right? That approach. No extra seats. Earn your way on. Pat, you got the last question. No, uh, uh, the back row. Sorry. Thank you. Pat Towell, Congressional Research Service. Sir. Uh, this integrated naval force has a certain quantum of fixed-wing TAC air, and you own some of it, and Admiral Gilday owns some of it. The piece of it that you own imposes costs on the Marine Corps, not just acquisition and operations support, but leadership attention, leadership structure. It's upwards of 75 years since Frank Jack Fletcher took his carriers and went away. Uh, on the table, is it conceivable that you could think about that as, as something you'd divest, divest of for the purposes of repurposing those resources? The topic hasn't come up. What has come up is the what's the right mix of F-35Bs or Cs, which is definitely related to uh, TAC air integration and how much of an investment the Marine Corps makes in terms of support and carrier air wings. Um, as far as what could I envision, could that be a topic that came up? Uh, I hope you've got the picture. Everything needs to be on the table. Is there uh, a red flag on it right now? No. But everything we do has to be scrutinized. But again, it, uh, I circle back to integrated in terms of the capability, the naval capability is what we're after. 
If that means we need more seas and need more flying off of carriers, we ought to be willing to do that. If it's less, we should be fine with that. It's all about what is the capability and capacity of the naval force that we need, not uh, what is the service-centric view. That's a different way of looking at it. So the Commandant has another event at 11. Uh, I believe it's about a 30-minute drive, and you got 32 <laughs> minutes to get there. Uh, so what I'd like to do is uh, just if you got a minute or two of closing comments, and then um, we'll hasten your departure. I hope uh, I told you my goal was twofold coming in here. One, to not educate, but to inform, to explain. Yes, and the second was to listen. And we've got note-takers in here that took good notes. So I'm, I'm very grateful first for the, for the chance to do both. I, I would, if it's possible, sir, ask to circle back on some things that you all have asked. Absolutely. If you can help me get to those people, because I want to follow up on their questions, because they not just intrigue me, but they cause us to think through things. So grateful for the opportunity, and the only ask is the chance to follow up on a couple that I would like to dig into deeper. Well, we'll have uh, this, uh, it's being live streamed, but also be archived, so we'll go back mm -hmm. and review that. Okay. But uh, uh, protocol here is uh, first name dot last name at heritage.org. So if anybody has a question you didn't get to ask, uh, seriously, send it to me, and I'll make sure it gets to the Commandant's team, and we can uh, get back some good answers. Thank so you, sir. You can thank join you. me, and thank you. Thank you. If we could just have uh, everybody kind of sit in place, I believe you've got a team that's going to get you out the door. Okay. And uh, I'll stay behind. Thank you so Thank much you, for sir. taking your time. Thank you. <laughs>